My name is Paul Williams, and I'm a professor of plant pathology and plant genetics at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I've been studying plants all of my life, ever since I was a kid. And over the past 35 or 40 years, I've become more and more interested in sort of the secrets that plants hold. Now, I specialize in a whole group of plants that are called brassicas. There's a great variety of forms of brassicas. These have been bred or domesticated over thousands of years by humans for different kinds of usage. Now, as a plant breeder and plant pathologist, I wanted to be able to put genetic resistance into these plants so that growers, farmers, and people all over the world would not have to spray them with chemicals. In order to find genetic resistance, I had to study to genetics of resistance. I had to study the genetics of these plants. And I came up against one really major problem. The brassicas that you see in front of you all take about a year to two years to go through their reproductive life cycle or lifespan. That is from seed to seed through the growing, flowering, pollinating, and seed production. So about 40 years ago, I got the idea as a plant breeder, maybe I could create a model plant that would reproduce, would have a lifespan much shorter than a year, and would reproduce, go through its life cycle in a very short time. I created an ideal, an, a mental image of the ideal plant. I wanted a plant that would flower fast and produce seed fast. I wanted it to grow at high population density so I could have lots of plants in a small space. And I wanted them to grow in the same environment that I grew in. I didn't want them to have a very cold environment or a very hot environment. I wanted them so to, to produce effectively to grow in that. Okay, so what I did was then I, I traveled around the world and collected brassica seeds from farmers and seed companies wherever I could find them. Of those thousands and thousands of plants, tens of thousands, only a very few among them were variable enough that they flowered faster than the common ones. And those were the ones I saved. There were a few turnip-like things that flowered earlier out of the hundreds of turnips. There were a few Chinese cabbage-like things that flowered. And so they were the ones that I pollinated. And I didn't pollinate them as turnips. I mixed them. And by mixing up the genetics of these, I was able to create a pool of plants, kind of a, a big population of plants, that was even more variable than these. And when I grew that, I was amazed to find that a larger percentage of those plants flowered much faster. They didn't look like any of these vegetables, but that didn't bother me. I was looking for a small plant that flowered early and would grow well in the soil. So they didn't, if they didn't grow well in the soil, they didn't flower. So that's the effect of environment. So they were beginning to adapt so I, to the environment I created. And that's a very important part of creating this tool. Okay, so what I found is that when I intermated or pollinated the ones that flowered first, their progeny, their children, flowered faster than the parents. And that may, amazed me. That was a very exciting thing. So I picked the 10%. That's 10 out of 100 that I grew that flowered fastest. And I intermated them. And what do you think happened to their progeny? Well, believe it or not, they flowered even faster than their parents. So the grandchildren were much faster than the grandparents, and the grandchildren were faster than the parents. So we were making what we call gain or progress from the selection of the fastest flowering plants. And after many generations of mass selection for the ideal type that I had in my mind, I ended up with fast plants. And that's what you see before you. A small plant that flowers very quickly, and when I pollinate it, there is some variation among individuals. It also, on pollination, produces a good crop of seed.